first, the people who attend planning and zoning board meetings are unrepresentative of the public. And several years ago, my BU colleagues, Katie Einstein and David Glick and I, collected the meeting minutes for zoning and planning boards for about 100 cities and towns around greater Boston. And we read all these meeting minutes, figured out who was speaking, what they were speaking about, and matched them up to public databases like the voter file. And what we find is that the people who show up compared to their communities are much whiter, much older, and much more likely to be homeowners. So young people, renters, and people of color are all underrepresented in the process. Their voices are not being heard by the decision makers. So I want to welcome all of you to this evening's panel discussion entitled Abundance Through Advocacy. Uh, my name is John Franca. I'm a professor of law here at Suffolk, uh, where I teach courses in property, land use, and urban law and policy, among other things. Um, and I'm also a proud member of this evening's sponsor, Abundant Housing in Massachusetts. And now I'm going to introduce our moderator for this evening, the board president of AMA, Molly Goodman, who will in turn introduce the four panelists. Molly um, is the board president uh, of AMA, as I mentioned, and has dedicated her career to supporting affordable housing and home ownership for low and moderate income residents of Massachusetts. She served as the manager of counseling and home ownership for the Alston Brighton Community Development Corporation and as a graduate fellow with the Brookline Housing Authority and a founding board member and clerk of AMA. Her career in public service began as a foreclosure prevention associate with Urban Edge. Molly received her JD from Suffolk University. We learned earlier today she graduated three months before I started on the faculty, um, where she served as a research assistant for Professor uh, Kathleen Engel. Uh, she's a graduate of Boston Latin School and of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Molly. Thank you so much, John. Um, and thank you for securing this room for us and securing this partnership with Suffolk Law to host the event here tonight. Um, Massachusetts has a severe housing shortage. We aren't building enough homes to keep pace with demand, especially near jobs and transit. What's more, 50 years after passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act, much of the housing stock we do have is largely, largely segregated by income and race. Abundant Housing Massachusetts is a nonprofit organization founded in 2020 to advocate for the creation of abundant housing for all and to develop and support a network of grassroots pro-housing groups and activists across Massachusetts. AMA is committed to fostering a movement that includes diverse voices, geography, and people with different lived experiences to help shape an inclusive statewide pro-housing network. We stand up for housing for all in all communities across Massachusetts. We drive policy at the state and local level by identifying pro-housing change makers, building the power of local organizers, and connecting a statewide network. We are so thrilled to have these four amazing speakers here today. Um, Jenny Schutz, Anika uh, Singh Lamar, Vicki Bean, and Maxwell Palmer. We're gonna welcome them up one by one to do an introduction um, to give you a little bit of background on their area of study and the work that they are bringing to this conversation. So we will start off with Jenny Schutz. I was planning to see, speak from sitting down, but it feels like I'm sort of on the corner of the room, so this is easier to make eye contact with all of you. Um, thanks very much uh, to Molly and Jesse and Cassie and Ama for inviting us. It's always fun to come and recruit more members to the pro-housing army. Um, so uh, my research focuses on housing policy and housing affordability nationally. You may have heard that there's an affordability problem and a housing supply problem across the whole country. By some estimates, we are maybe three and a half to four million homes short across the country. Um, and a lot of this dates back to the Great Recession. We essentially stopped building homes altogether for about four or five years. Production sort of ticked up after that uh, going into the pandemic, but we are in the hole about a decade. Of course, in places like Boston and New York and DC and most of the West Coast, the problem is actually more like 30 to 40 years of underbuilding homes. This isn't just some natural outcome of markets. This is very much a reflection of policy choices that have been made primarily by local governments. So for those of you who are familiar with the process in Boston, every city or town has its own zoning code, its own local environmental reviews, subdivision regulations, historic preservation, layers and layers of policy. Um, and a big part of this is not just the 
the rules that are written down on paper, it's the process by which local governments approve housing. In effect, local governments have outsourced a lot of their authority to existing homeowners who, as it turns out, often don't want any additional housing in their neighborhood, and certainly not housing that is relatively small and low cost that could be affordable, God forbid, to renter households who would destroy the neighborhood by moving in. So we have essentially locked in a lot of our very valuable land in places that have access to jobs and transportation, that have great public school systems and parks and all sorts of amenities. Those are the places that make it hardest to build housing and are least accessible to younger households who are looking for a place to move to. Um, this is not anything new to those of you who have been looking at the situation in Boston, but you should know that you are in good company or bad company. Um, actually, one of, the, one of the really striking features of the last, say, three to four years is that affordability has gone from being a big coastal metro problem to spilling over and affecting a lot of other places that have previously been affordable. So if you think about places like Austin, Nashville, Denver, traditionally have built a lot of housing to meet demand and were relatively affordable both to rent and to own, those places have now been overrun by demand from people who are priced out of expensive cities. They are running into the limits of easy land to develop and they are becoming much less affordable very quickly. So this is one of the trends that makes me nervous that we are seeing a tightening of supply in places where we haven't seen it. Those have been, in a sense, a safety valve for the really expensive metros. We know, of course, that the costs of underbuilding and of making housing more expensive don't fall equally on everyone. Um, this is particularly a problem for low and moderate income households. Uh, even before the pandemic, about 20 to 25% of households were cost burdened, spending more than half of their income on housing every month which leaves them not enough to pay for food and clothing and transportation and other necessities. I think it's also really important that we understand this isn't just a problem for poor families who are cost burdened, this is a problem for all of us, right? We have kids who are growing up in financially stressed households, in poor quality homes, uh, in homes that have environmental and health hazards. That's our workforce of the future, those are our citizens of the future, and we are under investing in the quality of their living environments today. There are huge climate impacts to not building homes in places like downtown Boston. It's not that people decide not to work in Boston. It's just that they decide to live two hours, three hours outside of town, drive longer, live in car dependent places. And again, the climate impacts of building homes in the wrong place rather than the right place, all of us are breathing more polluted air and are gonna have worse climate impacts because of this. I will say that there are some encouraging signs. One is that there are a lot of people who are getting involved with groups like AMA. Um, there's been just an enormous upsurgence of interest in grassroots local and state uh, advocacy organizations that show up at their city council meetings and ask for more housing that push back against the NIMBYs. There's an enormous amount of advocacy at the state level, which is new. Even five years ago, we didn't see that. States like Massachusetts, California, Maine have all passed statewide zoning reforms. That is a historic development, and I think very promising, moving in the direction of really applying policy levers where it matters. Um, this is not gonna be an easy problem to solve. We have lots of policies at lots of different levels of government to undo. Um, but the amount of energy involved with this has been really helpful. The focus from the, from the Biden administration, the national <coughs> level, state governments and local levels is really encouraging. Um, and it's particularly encouraging that there are people who will show up on a Thursday night to learn about this. Um, and of course, the next step is to show up on a Tuesday night and tell your city and town councilors that you want to reform the zoning and allow apartments by right everywhere. So just to give away some of the uh, <laughs> tips that we'll get into later. Um, but thanks for coming and I look forward to talking with you more. Hi. Uh, my name is Vicki Bean, and I'm a law professor at NYU Law School and, and uh, a proud uh, professor who had the pleasure of having John and Franca um, uh, work with me and, and, uh, and me work with him over the years. So, um, so but I also um, took two uh, detours from my academic research um, to uh, first to serve as Commissioner of Housing Preservation and Development in the city of New York. Uh, for three years, and then to serve as deputy mayor for housing and economic development for New York for um, for several years also. Um, I also have the pleasure of being one of the faculty advisors for the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, which does a great deal of work on, on what we can do to uh, increase the affordability of housing, increase the supply of housing, and increase the supply of affordable housing. Mm -hmm 
um, and tackle all of the problems that, that come up in doing that. So I think uh, Jenny and, and her book, which I highly recommend, have really um, laid out the, the case for um, why we need more housing supply, why we have a, a serious land use problem. And I want to talk just for a minute about what I think are the key issues in trying to solve that problem um, based upon, largely upon my work um, in city government in, in New York. Um, housing, of course, is a uh, perennial issue in New York. I have lived in New York uh, now for longer than I want to admit, um, uh, more than 40 years, and affordable, the affordability of housing has always um, been an issue, even during uh, the 1970s and 1980s when uh, New York City was basically emptying out. We still had an affordable housing problem because we, at that time it was a quality and abandonment problem. Um, but today we have just an incredible shortage of affordable housing and all of the things that stem from that in, uh, in addition to you know, the underinvestment in our children and our next generation, um, the incredible problem of, of homelessness. So when, um, when I was appointed uh, housing commissioner, we set a goal of trying to finance through, uh, through city tools, trying to finance the, either the rehab and preservation, so making it affordable for a very long time, or the new construction of 200,000 um, units of affordable housing over a 10-year period. Um, and I'm uh, happy to say that we um, met that goal and indeed um, met it two years early. Um, and increase the goal to um, 300,000 over, uh, over a 12-year period, which is still going on. And so what are the key elements of that? What do you really have to do to solve the kinds of problems that Jenny was talking about? I think there are really, I wanna highlight four main um, issues. The first is we need more land, right? We're, we're not generally able to make land, so you have to make land available for housing, and that means rezoning um, major pieces of land to allow higher density, not necessarily high density. You can rezone to allow sort of light touch density in, in areas that are already very low density, but you need to make more land available. And the key way to do that is, is through rezoning, but there are also other ways as well. You can really prioritize certain kinds of lands, like lands owned by religious institutions, which are all, often available for housing development, lands owned by non nonprofits of various types, government owned land, school owned lands, those kinds of things. So we gotta make more land available to, to use for development in housing. The second thing is we need to reduce the costs of building housing and where, what drives those costs. Those costs are driven by really the uncertainty and the risk and the time it takes to get through an approval process. So reducing the discretion, reducing the ability of local governments to exercise discretion to keep uh, a building from being built, reducing the number of veto points that we have even once a developer runs the gauntlet, finally gets the rezoning or, or whatever permit is required, we still then have years of litigation um, because of various veto points. So that's critical. It's critical to reduce requirements that are driving up costs, but at the same time may be completely inconsistent with goals like uh, a, a responding to climate change and adapting to climate change. So reducing or eliminating parking minimums, for example really taking a look at your zoning code and your housing code to figure out what's imposing costs and how can we reduce those. A third thing is you, we really need to ensure affordability, right? We need to ensure that we're not just getting uh, high-end housing, high-end uh, market rate housing, or even middle-end market rate housing, but that there is some affordable housing. And the tools that we have for doing that are things like inclusionary housing that require that a certain share of the housing always be built as affordable. And then the last thing that I think is critically important is that we need to address the fears of displacement, right? And the fears that neighborhoods will change in ways that the current residents um, do not um, you know, find compatible with what they want in their neighborhood. 
And the first part of that is really tackling the perception that it's new housing that causes that, as opposed to new housing being a solution to that. Um, and then we do need tools to try to prevent displacement. And we can talk about um, some of what those are, but having, ensuring that whenever new building is happening, some of it is affordable is a key uh, aspect of that. So happy to talk about those issues um, uh, in the Q&A, but I think those are the key, key points. Just a few minor things we need to fix um, uh, in order to, um, uh, to move forward. So thanks so much to Ama for, for sponsoring this and for having me. Okay, we're making our way up the Northeast Corridor from DC to New York. I'm coming to you from New Haven, um, Connecticut. Um, uh, uh, location in the world that my colleague Bob Elkson has described as the land of large lots. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what uh, my students and I are up to on the ground to try to address um, some of the problems that come when you come from the land of large lots. Um, I'm also a law professor. I teach um, all experiential courses. So my students and I are working largely with, mostly with clients or some kind of project partner on the ground on some kind of project. I'm a dirt lawyer by trade, which is why I have slides because real estate people like pictures. Um, my students are mostly law students, but I also um, <coughs> teach an interdisciplinary clinic that's housed at our School of Architecture at the Yale Urban Design Workshop that is mostly architecture students um, and a handful of business students and law students to make sure the architecture students don't go too nuts. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects, though, that are in the primary clinic I teach, which is the Community and Economic Development Clinic. Um, so we do fairly traditional community development work alongside other things, which I'll describe in a second. Um, each of these slides is going to talk about advocacy we do with some group. We do advocacy with community development corporations. Here's an example um, of a 6,000 square foot, 130 year old house that a client of mine is turning into workforce housing as well as um, a daycare program on the first floor. Um, we also do a lot of zoning work. So with neighborhood and merchants associations, we will represent um, clients that are seeking rezonings in their neighborhoods, typically to densify, to permit more housing. I do want to be clear that the SRO moratorium in that headline was not our client's idea. Um, just happened to be before our city council on the same day that we were there, and those are my students together with a client of theirs um, a couple years ago. Um, we also do work with folks who you might not think would um, be affected by zoning issues, um, small businesses, including daycare providers. In Connecticut and also here in Massachusetts, there's no state level prohibition on local zoning officials barring home-based childcare. New York is way ahead of us on this, um, uh, where you can't do that per state law or per common law, per court law. Um, but in Connecticut, we still have this problem. Um, so we actually do quite a lot of work, both with the individual childcare providers to run them through the zoning gauntlet, which is when you think about a multifamily housing developer having to run through that gauntlet is pretty bad, but a home-based childcare provider having to run through it is pretty bad too. Um, and, and then we've also done some advocacy to try to change state law on that. We also do work with community-based housing developers. This is a client of mine in the town of Brantford, Connecticut, which is very much in the land of large lots. We're talking mm, maybe a 10-minute drive from downtown New Haven. Um, a site where a community-based um, developer sought to put 67 units of family housing. Um, and on the right-hand side here, you've got um, some of the quotes from the first series of public hearings that occurred on this application. And the reason it's formatted the way it is is because this is from a complaint in Connecticut Superior Court um, appealing the denial of our approvals. I won't necessarily read all of these out loud because some of them are pretty nasty. Um, we did win this case in the trial court. It got remanded back essentially to the Planning and Zoning Commission. We went again, they denied us again. We went back to court, we won again, um, and uh, we broke ground last month. Um, but the, having to do that for every project um, obviously is not sustainable. Um, 
So we uh, filed um, at the end of August a lawsuit on behalf of the Open Communities Trust, which is an affiliate of a fair housing organization in Connecticut called the Open Communities Alliance, um, as well as um, a foundation that funds affordable housing and two individual plaintiffs. Uh, we filed a lawsuit in the town of Woodbridge, Connecticut, which is immediately adjacent to New Haven, it is zoned, um, and this is our client, the executive director of our client, Erin Boggs, behind her is um, the chair of her board, Connie Royster, um, and another local housing advocate, Benita Grabs, and next to Reverend Grabs are um, five of the students from my clinic. Um, these are some of the snippets from the complaint in the Woodbridge case. The map on um, the right here, or my right and your left, is the map of Woodbridge, it's showing you zone A, which is the two acre minimum zone in the town of Woodbridge, 98.6 of Woodbridge's residentially zoned land prohibits multifamily altogether. And in the other 1.4%, you need a special exception to build multifamily. I don't need to tell you all probably that they've never granted that special <laughs> exception. Um, <laughs> A couple of other snippets here. You know, a lot of what we hear when we do this kind of advocacy is, well, if low-income people live in Woodbridge, where are they going to work? Well, it turns out they already work in Woodbridge. Um, Woodbridge has permitted the construction of multiple assisted living facilities, for example. Um, and the primary locations where people who, in, who work in Woodbridge live are all of the racially diverse, more urban areas um, outside of Woodbridge, whether it's New Haven, Bridgeport, et cetera. And you can see here um, the impact that their zoning has um, on the makeup of the town. There are so few black students in Woodbridge schools that the um, Department of Ed basically can't count them. Um, so we made a couple of claims here. I can run through this pretty quickly, but um, John asked me to talk about litigation. And even though I don't normally do a lot of litigation, uh, 15 years of being a real estate lawyer in Connecticut will drag you to court eventually if you want to get anything done. <laughs> so we um, have made a claim that um, Woodbridge's zoning violates the Connecticut Zoning Enabling Act, which requires, among other things, that um, town zoning must encourage the development of housing opportunities, um, including opportunities for multifamily dwellings. And as you can see, Woodbridge really doesn't. Um, the state Zoning Enabling Act also requires that zoning um, in our towns promotes housing choice and economic diversity not just for the people who live in Woodbridge, but for people in the region. We've also made claims under the Connecticut State Constitution. Connecticut's one of a handful of states, maybe three or four, where the Constitution not only bars um, racially discriminatory acts, it also um, bars subjection to segregation. And we think that what's happening right here is a perpetuation of segregation. And then we also make claims under Connecticut's Fair Housing Act, um, both that, uh, there's violations of the Fair Housing Act's protections um, against discrimination based on race. But also, Connecticut's got a source of income discrimination prohibition, which means you cannot um, deny housing to somebody based on the fact that they're paying their rent or their mortgage with a housing voucher, with Section 8. And um, we think that Woodbridge is zoning by basically prohibiting rental housing um, has the effect of discriminating against people who would use a voucher to pay the rent. And that's that, that's me. Happy to take questions. <clears throat> All right, uh, thank you to Abundant Housing in Suffolk for having me. I'm Max Palmer. I'm a professor of political science at Boston University. So I'm approaching this topic a little bit differently, thinking about how people and their political behaviors intersect with zoning laws and regulations and all the different institutions that are involved with housing politics. And I want to briefly talk about three different pieces of evidence that my colleagues and I uh, are thinking about or have found in doing our research. First, about the people who participate in the housing process, who show up at meetings and try usually to stop housing and that these people are not representative of the public, either in their demographics or their views. Uh, second, a little bit about exclusionary restrictions, things like preferences for senior housing uh, or for current residents over other residents and the discriminatory impacts of them. And then third, 
on Massachusetts thinking about how we don't even know where all the affordable housing in Massachusetts is and what a big problem this is for everybody involved in housing. <clears throat> First, the people who attend planning and zoning board meetings are unrepresentative of the public. And several years ago, my BU colleagues, Katie Einstein and David Glick and I, collected the meeting minutes for zoning and planning boards for about 100 cities and towns around greater Boston. And we read all these meeting minutes, figured out who was speaking, what they were speaking about, and match them up to public databases like the voter file. And what we find is that the people who show up compared to their communities are much whiter, much older, and much more likely to be homeowners. So young people, renters, and people of color are all underrepresented in the process. Their voices are not being heard by the decision makers uh, <clears throat> who are ultimately deciding whether to grant variances or issue permits uh, or change zoning codes and their views are also different, but they're really hard to uncover and find because of how we sort of think about getting public input. And so two years ago, the city of Newton wanted to take a different approach to thinking about public input on increasing density. And so they did a mixed approach. They had public meetings, they did a survey, and they also held focus groups targeted at certain communities. And so when they talked to renters, uh, to young people, to people of color, uh, and other underrepresented groups, they saw really high levels of support for increased housing density. Those are the, the big bars at the top. When they did a survey where people could opt in, it tended to be mostly homeowners, and they were really opposed to housing. Same at a big townwide public meeting they held about these issues. So who you ask and how you ask really changes the views that we might see in the exact same place. The second thing I want to show you is that exclusionary restrictions things like senior housing or local preferences can be really discriminatory and really shape who gets access to affordable housing in Massachusetts. And I'll talk about this data a little bit more in a minute. It comes from Housing Navigator, an awesome Massachusetts nonprofit who's trying to provide information for people looking for subsidized housing about what's actually out there. But in places like Winchester or Winthrop, wealthy suburbs of Boston, um, <clears throat> we see most of the affordable housing in places is reserved for seniors. Very little gets built for families. And when you build senior housing, given the demographics of the area, this can have racial equity impacts as well, as it affects a wider population, excludes people of color at a higher rate. And senior housing is often used to keep out families and to tend to reduce density. And we can look at meeting transcripts like we just saw and see lots of comments like this. Like this building will have too many people. If we make it senior housing, it will have fewer people with fewer cars and fewer impacts on town services. So restrictions like this or local preferences where any new housing gets reserved for the people who already live there uh, can have discriminatory impacts. Finally, I want to talk about information fragmentation, a very big problem for people trying to learn about housing. Whether you are a housing activist trying to organize, a town official trying to learn about the makeup of housing in your town, an academic like us, uh, or somebody seeking affordable housing, you might think we're in Massachusetts. We should be able to look up somewhere. Where is all the subsidized housing? How much of it is there in every town? And it turns out you can't. There is a mass amount of fragmentation. Different federal and state programs track different kinds of housing. There is no one complete place you can go to find everything that exists. How are you as a policymaker supposed to know what exists? How many different kinds of units of different bedroom sizes are available in the first place? How do you make good planning decisions going forward to figure out what to build? Massachusetts does not do a good job with this. In contrast, New York City actually has a really excellent database of the kinds of affordable housing that are available and this data here comes from Housing Navigator and shows us the number of subsidized rental units in a select set of cities, and then, relatively speaking, uh, their units as a percentage of total housing units. So places like Newton, that might look like they have uh, a lot of units relative to other suburbs, actually comparably few as a percentage of its housing stock. But if you're looking for housing, this kind of data is really not publicly available. And as I mentioned, Housing Navigator, this nonprofit, is trying to do it where the state has so far failed. So one big challenge, and I'm excited to see the Housing uh, Zoning Atlas and other efforts to make information more publicly available is really important to addressing this crisis as well. Thank you.
much for those great introductions. I'm just gonna kick it off with the first question. Um, and this question is for Vicki. I'm gonna combine two of the submitted questions. Um, there are so many luxury units, condo units and apartments being built these <coughs> days. Is there really a demand for it? Are people actually filling all these luxury high rises in Boston, Greater Boston and the New York area? Um, do we have data on the quantity of unoccupied homes? So, um, first of all, part of the issue is everybody defines luxury as, um, you know, as something that they don't can't afford or don't want, right? Um, and so, I, I think we have to be careful about that term. Um, market rate housing is, uh, unfortunately, has become a luxury because we have allowed so little of it. Right, but that doesn't mean that we're only building luxury housing. It means that the cost of housing is way too high. But often what people are talking about when they ask the, those questions are second homes, third homes, fourth homes um, that people have in um, basically superstar cities like New York and, and Boston. And there certainly are uh, superstar homes. There are, um, those homes are often occupied only for weekends or only for during the week for people who have um, uh, weekend houses elsewhere or are only occupied for a few weeks out of the year for people who have homes elsewhere. That is a, a feature of, of having, of attracting very wealthy people um, to your city. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of that, but they're not unoccupied houses. They are unoccupied on a, a full-time basis, but that does not mean that they're unoccupied houses. Um, there are, there is a, um, a problem in New York in response to um, largely changes in our rent stabilization law that have made it very difficult for um, some units to be rehabbed where you are seeing um, rent stabilized units being held off the market because they basically aren't at the level of quality that are you need to have them rented, um, but the landlord is not renovating them because they are arguing that they don't have the funds to do that under the rent stabilization law. So there, are, there is a separate group of properties that are those um, unoccupied, unavailable for rent, uh, rent stabilized apartments, and that is a, a major problem. Thank you. Um, I sort of will follow up to this question with Jenny. Um, Vicki already touched on this, but do we need more market rate housing? And what do you think about the label luxury housing? Uh, the answer to the first part is yes, we absolutely need more market rate housing. We also need more below market rate subsidized housing. We need more housing of all of the kinds. Um, so I actually like to think about uh, the term luxury not applied to the structure, but applied to the land, right? We have luxury land and luxury locations, right? The places where lots of people want to live that the land itself is very expensive. The question is, what kind of housing do you put on that, and especially how many homes do you put on that, right? So there's a, there's a neighborhood in Washington, D.C. that I like to point to. It's maybe a mile away from the White House. This is a Calorama Triangle. Um, Barack Obama has a house there. Uh, um, uh, Ivanka Trump and, uh, and Jared Kushner rented a house there. There are a lot of ambassadors' residences there. It's a single-family neighborhood a mile away from downtown D.C. with these huge houses on probably half acre lots. That land is unbelievably expensive, but you've got one house sitting on top of it, only one family that can occupy that lot. You go across the street into the next neighborhood where you're allowed to build apartment buildings, and you've got about the same piece of land with a 200 unit apartment building on it, right? Each of those 200 units of apartments are much cheaper than the single family house that's occupying that parcel of land, right? So one of the best ways to make housing more affordable in places where land is expensive is build a whole lot of homes stacked vertically and small homes on that one parcel of land, right? Um, and so, you know, I, th I think it's just important, and you know, we, we tend to attach the luxury housing 
housing to new construction, uh, to buildings that have a lot of amenities, that have a rooftop pool, that have you know a garden space. Um, the amenities are not what's driving most of the cost of construction. So new construction will be more expensive than older homes because new construction is expensive. The materials are expensive, the labor is expensive, the process of getting through a thousand community meetings and yelling at neighbors is expensive. You're paying your lawyers and your architects and engineers every time you go back and redesign the building, right? So the process of making new, cons new housing makes the final product very expensive, but also the fact that we are not allowed to build as many units as the market would like to means that those units have to be sold or, or rented at a very high price. Um, Max or Anika, do you want to <coughs> chime in on this question or should we move on? Yeah, move on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Anika, I think your, your lawsuits are really fascinating and I'm wondering if there is something unique about Connecticut's Enabling Act that creates that private right of action to enforce. Mm -hmm. And if so, is that something you know we could replicate here in Massachusetts? Um, there's nothing particularly unique about Connecticut's Zoning Enabling Act. Um, but like I said, the anti-segregation clause is unique, is fairly unique. I think I get they said there's maybe three or four states that have that. Um, the language um, that from the Zoning Enabling Act that I cited is uh, not that old. It's um, about relative to the Zoning Enabling Act itself. Zoning Enabling Act, like most states, Zoning Enabling Act is almost 100 years old has been revised obviously many times over those years. But that language about economic diversity and multifamily housing dates back to the early 90s um, to an earlier housing affordability crisis um, from the same era when Connecticut adopted its version of Massachusetts 40B, um, which provides um, a kind of burden shifting for affordable housing developers and inclusionary developers who are appealing uh, land use and zoning decisions. Um, Awesome, thank you. Um, I, I think this question will go to Jenny, um, but it builds on that similar, like what are other states doing? Should Massachusetts housing advocates push for cities and towns to create housing elements every decade as is required in California and now being used as a way to leverage more housing production because of higher targets and HCD enforcement? So let me answer that in two ways. One, I think it's really essential that state governments lean into pushing local governments to build more housing and build more diverse kinds of housing. Um, and part of this is that we are never gonna get to the goals that we need, sort of the regional and national goals of building more homes, if every single city or town has to reform its own zoning, set its own plans, get through this, right? I mean, there are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. I don't know how many there are in Connecticut. Can I tell, can I, because this is, there are 169 towns in Connecticut, but there are more zoning authorities than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add, there are fire districts and beach associations in the state of Connecticut that have zoning authority. Yeah, we're never going to get there at the local <laughs> level. So, you know, one of the advantages of the state setting some goals is just to have a clear target. We need more housing. Everybody's going to need to do more. You know, how states can go about this is a really interesting question that we, we actually don't have enough kind of empirical research because that not that many states have done this, right? So Massachusetts has 40B. California has a whole series of laws, including this regional housing needs assessment. Um, it, you know, New Jersey has a fair share law as well. So there are a handful of states that have various approaches, but this is mostly quite new, right? Only a handful have had them for very long. They've been quite different approaches. In many cases, they've not been well enforced. So, you know, California, in theory, assigns every local government a number of new housing units they have to build. Um, they have not been held accountable for doing that. So they had to plan for it, but they didn't actually have to build the housing until pretty recently recently, 
the current attorney general is choosing to be pretty aggressive and you know, in, in sort of setting the targets and then enforcing them and will sue local governments that are not meeting their target. That is a choice of this administration, so I don't know also whether that's gonna outlive the current administration. That's one danger that it might get rolled back. I think what Massachusetts has done with encouraging more multifamily zoning around commuter rail stations and transit stations is great, in part because those are the places that need to be building the most housing, and many of them have not. Right, The western part of the state doesn't need to build as much housing because there isn't as much growth there, Right, concentrating it in the area. So figuring out from the state level where are the places that need to be building more housing and then what's the policy lever that gets you there. Leaning on transportation is useful because the state runs the transportation system that provides a lot of the funding for that. And so that gives them more legal authority and some financial tools to work with. It's not easy to come up with a number to assign to each locality. You need to build X number of units and your neighbor needs to build Y number of units. That's not a precise science. Um, I almost think in some sense it doesn't matter what the number is. There's value in having a quantitative target and then being able to measure benchmarks, right? Setting a target that's maybe too low, but then enforcing it and make sure that they're, I mean, you know, like if Wellesley built any apartments, that would be a giant, you know, improvement over what they're doing currently. And, you know, you start with something that's actually enforceable and manageable and then build on that where you go. Thank you. Can I? jump in on that sure um, I do think it's really important and, and I want to emphasize a point that that Maxwell made it's really important to, to count right? <laughs> if you don't count it you you don't know what you're doing and people can get away with all kinds of things and there's a second reason to count it and set goals and to know how you're doing and meeting those goals by having a database that shows you uh, it, and that is the there's often a perception of of communities or of neighborhoods within a, a city that they're being asked to bear more than their fair share. And we could argue until the cows come home about what exactly fair share means and what it is, but they need to be able to see how what they're being required to do relates to what other communities are doing as well. Um, and I think that that both of those reasons make counting and having numerical goals really critical. Can I just add one little thing to that? Mm -hmm. I think one reason it's important to set the goal and to be explicit that the goal is units is that otherwise people will latch onto other things. So one thing you hear a lot is, well, we did a lot last year because we spent X dollars or because our inclusionary rate is 20%. Um, and those are obviously not indicators of anything. And in the <laughs> absence of some kind of numerical goal, people will cite other goals. And I think oftentimes it's a red herring. I mean, it's purposefully being distracting, um, but that's just to emphasize. So one way that Massachusetts has been um, focusing on increasing our planned zoning for multifamily housing is the housing choice law, a piece of it called the MBTA communities, requires the 175 communities that have MBTA service um, to zone around their transit stops. Um, within I think half a mile and to, to, to plan and zone for by right multifamily development. Uh, this question is for Max. Do you have any advice for volunteers in greater Boston suburbs working to comply with the MBTA multifamily housing law? That's a, that's a great question and <laughs> this, is, this is a great law with a lot of really interesting potential because it's going to force towns to change their zoning and make it by right that doesn't mean that there will be new housing in these places, but just that this possibility is now, now possible, that now exists. So, but one thing we've seen the last year is a lot of fighting between these towns and the state of, are we an MBTA community or not? And towns were fighting to say, we're actually a little bit too far away from this commuter rail station, we shouldn't count. <laughs> and then fighting about, we shouldn't have to build this many units because we can't handle it, because of past choices we've made, because we've already built a lot. So there's intense politics of coming up with the numbers and to Jay's point of maybe any number is better than nothing, potentially, but they're all trying to fight to get their numbers down, or many of them are. Um, I think the most important thing if you're working in your town is to really fight to not let your town delay. There are deadlines, but as we've seen in Massachusetts politics time and time again, deadlines are not always enforced, they are targets. Um, so really putting pressure on your town officials, going into meetings to push to get zoning codes adapted sooner. The sooner these changes are made, the sooner somebody can use that new zoning to build by right. I think a lot of towns are gonna take an approach of, 
waiting as long as they can, forcing the state to sue them, all things that are delay tactics. And delay is really, really expensive. I think all of us have mentioned this in one form or another. One big cost of housing is you're a developer, you have a piece of land or an option on a piece of land, and you're paying money every day you're not building, and it's expensive. And the longer it takes, the more expensive it is. Well said. Does anyone else want to chime in on that? I, I will make one general comment about sort of the state target setting. The, you know, there's, there's sort of how do you do the math and come up with the numbers? There's also a question about how prescriptive you want to be about the type of housing, right? So California has, has of, of course, taken this to the extreme. Um, they actually prescribe the number of units that have to be built that are affordable to certain tiers of income. Um, you know, the Massachusetts law, I think they, they have targets about the number, about the density of housing that needs to be allowed. Um, you know, there's been a lot of focus on preempting uh, the bans of certain kinds of structures. So legalizing ADUs or legalizing duplex, so, so focusing on structure types. Um, you know, the economist in me would kind of like to just set the target number and then provide some flexibility on the rest of it, right? So like in some places, it may be that a four-story apartment is the best use of that land and that's what the developer wants to build and that they can make the deal pencil um, and that's what they should build. And in other cases, it may be that they can get to similar kinds of densities numbers by doing townhouses, which are somewhat cheaper construction to do or fit the site better. I, I, you know, I would say that states should have super strong priors when it gets to the details beyond kind of the headline number, right? And that also, I think, makes it easier to get some localities on board. They still have control over where the zone is created and over the structure type and, you know, somewhat over the maybe design review process as long as they hit their target number, right? But I think that's both something that politically can work better and also just, like, fits the market. So moving on um, to Anika. Um, I'm wondering what role you think law professors can play in educating local government officials on, on the logistics of zoning. And I'll, I'll just add that when I was in law school, I was working for a, a real estate law firm, and I was really frustrated by the fact that the textbooks and the lesson plans that we were learning did not align with what I was doing in my everyday work. Um, and it really it felt as though a lot of uh, feelings were driving what was going on on the ground versus actual law and and regulations. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if you think law professors can play a role there. Good question. Um, you know, one thing we did in, uh, one, one thing we had to actually fight a couple of years for because there was actually resistance in Connecticut is some kind of mandatory training for planning and zoning commissioners. Um, and uh, I do think that that's really important. Um, we uh, we pushed, the advocacy community in Connecticut pushed for that with a focus on fair housing laws, but I don't think that's the only thing that, um, I don't think that's the only thing that matters. Um, uh, you know, Max and his co-authors have written about the importance of educating commissioners on the biases of people who testify before them. I mean, there's all sorts of things that there ought to be education about, and I don't know that all of those topics are things that law professors are necessarily, like, uniquely qualified to, um, to share. Um, but I do think that if you're going to have this kind of decision-making authority, that there ought to be some kind of um, mandatory, periodic, like not one-time um, uh, training, we kind of valorize the role that lay people play in making these decisions. Um, but the decisions are actually quite complicated and they have enormous ramifications. Um, and so given the complexities and the ramifications, most commissioners end up either deferring to staff or deferring to um, their neighbors. And uh, the least we can do, I think, is to kind of give them some ability to exercise some kind of independent decision making. I do think this stuff is really hard, particularly in these small towns where um, planning and zoning commissioners, housing authority commissioners, I mean, all these people are running into their neighbors in the street. Um, in the grocery store, and I have had uh, clients involved with local organizations, particularly in suburban Connecticut, who have said to me, like, I can't, I can't go to the grocery store. I had a, a board member, a, a board member of a client um, whose last name rhymed with go. So at some point, all over town, there were lawn signs saying, Dad, hello, has got to go. 
um, that's really hard. <laughs> um, so uh, th you can't necessarily fix that with training. There's obviously some um, political will and whatnot that goes with being able to make decisions that might make your neighbors angry, but education's a piece of it. Max, yeah. Um, <laughs> so bef before the second half of your answer, which is gonna <laughs> uh, contradict, you should get yourself on these boards. <laughs> there are 300 plus towns in Massachusetts and they all have planning and zoning boards. And in many places they struggle to find good people who want to be on them and are willing to put in the time and the work to actually do it and go to all these meetings and all. And if there's an opportunity in your town to actually get on one of these boards, that might be a lot more effective than trying to persuade people who are already on them to think the way you do. But there is the downside. Why don't you guys just <laughs> consolidate some of your cities and towns? <laughs> then you wouldn't have to find quite so many planning and zoning commissioners. There's a whole nother set of lawn signs that happened when yes. that, yeah. that gets proposed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think to follow up on that, Max, do you think that we should have public participation in local zoning decisions? <clears throat> public participation is a really important element of local democracy. And it's a big challenge that we think about a lot of what should be the role of the public, of project neighbors. You know, getting rid of it, public participation was created because of previous problems of urban renewal that wasn't listening to the community. And so one extreme is no participation, and that has tremendous consequences and downsides. On the other hand, now, in many places, that participation serves as repeated veto points that stop anything. And one big challenge about participation in, say, Massachusetts, project abutters get notified whenever there's a permitting process in their immediate vicinity. All the people who could live in that housing later don't because they're not an identifiable community. They, we don't know who they are. They don't know who they are. And so if you're a neighbor and you don't like a project, it's easy to show up to one meeting or for a bunch of meetings for one project. If you want that housing, you can't go to all of these meetings in all of these towns. So it, the structure biases, you know, the results. One thing that my colleagues and I argue is that we should have a lot of participation in the zoning process. Have a lot of public hearings, a lot of comments about where should the zones be drawn? If we have a target that we have to build, let's get the zoning right and then let people build by right once that zoning is right. So move the, move the fights to the zoning and where we're going to allow for buildings to be built, but phase out as much participation in project review and in, trying to, in all the little things at the individual project level. I would agree with that. <laughs> um, I think we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience now. And Cassie has a microphone, so just get her attention. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much. This I re really interesting stories. I'm uh, my name is Alan. I'm in Cambridge, and I kind of wanted to ask about the advocacy piece of the abundance through advocacy. I feel like I don't know. I've I've heard a lot about like what this what like we need the policymakers to do, or what we need the like the judges to do, or what we need the planning staff to do. But this is kind of like like we have or we need to have some elite consensus on what will happen, and then it'll just happen. And I, in Cambridge, there's been a long history of kind of these enlightened inner circle people like putting in changes to create more housing and then it gets rolled back five years later as, as the housing starts to actually get built and people get upset. So I guess my question is, is kind of like leading lights in the, in the elite consensus club, like how do you interface with the mass movements and the mass politics of this stuff? Like, how do you make these reforms stick? And how do we deal with these kind of two different fronts of advocacy? I can try to start with that. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's the work is constant. Um, the client who I mentioned who is the plaintiff in the lawsuit against Woodbridge um, uh, has a fairly sizable community organizing effort. I mean, I have been out with them in um, church basements or when you're doing it in Westport, just like a whole separate annex um, of, uh, uh, sorry, Connecticut joke, um, uh, uh, where you're just in the community talking to people basically nonstop and trying to um, develop allies um, where you may not have anticipated having them. Um, their coalition consists of um, various groups around the state, um, including uh, 
uh, religiously affiliated organizing groups and like the kind of IAF model, um, uh, the home builders, um, social services organizations, the NAACP in Connecticut, um, just it runs the gamut and working with that group of partners is again, it's just a constant effort to constantly be in communication and then to develop the groundwork in these various towns so that when something comes up or if it's not coming up that you make it come up um, that either a development is being proposed or there's some kind of land purchase opportunity really at any moment that there's um, a group of people there willing to advocate for the affordable housing to get um, to get built so that's in the towns and obviously at the state level then there's another analogous um, kind of parallel parallel structure and we're a small state but it's hard to organize around towns i suspect in massachusetts it's fairly fairly similar sometimes you know towns within five miles of each other it'll still it'll feel like light years away in terms of what the political conversation is um so i i certainly don't want to suggest that this thing happens in a vacuum right um uh it's the result of kind of years of um years of community organizing and groundwork advocacy can I, can I just add to that? I mean, when I was in city government, uh, certainly the advocacy community was so critical to everything that we were doing, uh, everything that we were trying to do, in part to help us do it better, right? We learned a great deal from public participation. It's not all anti. It, it can be can really show you what it, you know situations are on the ground that you need to know about in, in framing your zoning. Um, but also just to counter, it's just, it's really hard for, as, as Anika was saying, for a bunch of commissioners to listen to person after person after person saying, you know, we don't want the, to change the nature of our community. We want to protect this, you know, the quality of our schools, all of those things, and not hear uh, other voices in that. Um, and also it's just so much more effective when when you have a lot of opposition um, at a public hearing or that kind of thing for instead of like government officials or the planning commissioners to have to be rebutting that or to try, trying to you know push back at that to have other people right um, not government officials um, be in there saying you know what well, that that's not true or that's not what you don't represent a great many of people in this community or those kinds of things is just is really critically important um, and the you know the 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 vital role that having a diversity of voices um, plays is is just uh, I can't overstate it. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think policy changes. The policy changes that have happened would not have happened without advocates on the ground showing up, right? Uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, which has about a million people, so it's you know effectively a city, although it's a, a DC suburb, just passed their Thrive 2050, so it's sort of like a comp plan. They have been having hearings on this, public hearings for two to three years now, and consistently the local housing advocacy groups showed up, made sure their members showed up, got people to come to in-person meetings, to virtual meetings, to write letters, to get their friends and neighbors to show up, and they just finally passed it with a unanimous vote against a lot of entrenched homeowner opposition, deep opposition from a small group, but they were able to show that there was broad support. The other thing that I think is really important for housing advocacy groups that are sort of single issue groups is to find your friends who exist elsewhere. Who are the other advocacy groups in other policy areas that you can work with? Are there fair housing groups? Are there traditional affordable housing advocacy groups who are focused on homeless services and prevention and subsidies? Um, you know, are there uh, you know are there groups that are focused on childcare? You know, religious organizations that are already in the space. But finding another set of groups makes your voice that much stronger and louder. Thanks. Um, uh, my name is Bob Van Meter, and I've been active in a, a number of housing advocacy efforts and affordable housing development. Um, I, I think all of what you said about organizing and advocacy is true, and many of us in this room have been doing it for years and decades. Um, 
I want to, I guess, go to a little bit uh, the, the same issue, but at another level. About um, four or five months ago, there was a wonderful interview that Ezra Klein did with you, Jenny, and he was pushing you very hard on this question of um, basically, are there too many local democratic mechanisms and institutions, and is that, you know, and I think that question is raised also by the work that, that Max and his partners did. And um, as somebody who lives in one of the 351 cities and towns, um, and, you know, I often think that if we were in a region and had a regional government like Montgomery County, it would be easier, but maybe not. Um, you know, there was an incredibly depressing Ezra Klein story about Los Angeles's struggle to solve the homelessness crisis this weekend in the New York Times. And that's kind of, I guess, an affirmation of the home voter hypothesis. And, the, um, and I guess I'd like um, all of the panelists to kind of uh, say something about what they think about the issue of local democracy and housing decisions. And do we, do we need to move in a new direction as a country in order to make rational decisions about housing policy? So I have two, two quick answers to that. Um, I, I think Max nailed it when he said we need to move the decision making from the project level up to the, to the policy level, right? So rather than every single apartment having to be voted on and have to have community engagement, you do a rewrite of the zoning code of the comprehensive plan, neighborhood plans, whatever those are. That's the point where there's public input. That's done, and then when it's put in place, as much as possible can be built by right. So the projects can move forward, right? You know, figuring out what the interval is, how often do you need to do a rewrite of the comp plan? Yeah, I mean, this, it's, a, it's a huge issue for New England where you've got lots of these smaller things. So the second part of that is some of the decision-making authority should get moved up to the state level, particularly in places where there's this local fragmentation. You know, again, this, you know, state legislators and the governor are elected, right? So like we have, we have democracy at the local and state level because we have elections, right? In some sense, it, you know, a, a city that elects a slate of pro-house counselors and mayors who then enact pro-housing policies, that is local democracy, right? And a handful of homeowners showing up to protest it is pushing against the results of their elections, right? So that's not particularly democratic. So you know, I think some of this, and it, it is hard to persuade people of that, but things like, you know, Max was saying, doing these broader surveys and focus groups so that you can show the numbers, right? If 60% of the people who live in Cambridge want there to be an affordable housing overlay, that's a majority vote. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry, you got outvoted on this one, right? But having the numbers to back that up is really helpful. You know, having the visibility of advocates at the meetings is helpful too, but having some numbers is a good piece as well. Uh, I, I agree with all that. To add on, on two different elements of your question, one, you know, the idea of consolidating municipalities in Massachusetts might be appealing to some of us. <laughs> a political non-starter, I think, in every city and town in the area. I also would say if you look at places like New York City or Los Angeles and all, we see even though it's one government, there's fragmentation. There becomes different sort of neighborhood organizations that, or councils that end up with real power. And so I, I wonder that if you were to consolidate, maybe things refragment pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> and then I think we have this notion, we think about local democracy, this old idea about sort of sorting that we vote with our feet and we pick, we have a bunch of communities that we could live in and they have different levels of taxes and schools and transit and density. And you pick the one that's right for you under some budget constraint. And with the housing market and the shortage, that doesn't exist anymore. A lot of people who are in one place now can't afford to move anywhere else. If you bought a home in the greater Boston area 10 years ago, you probably can't afford to move anywhere you know, else, especially with mortgage rates and all changing and prices being so high. We don't get to sort in that way. And so a lot of sort of this old notion of we want lots of communities offering different things doesn't really seem to be the same viable possibility. So that's sort of undercut or cutting against the other issue, but I think we're, we're stuck with what we have for the most part. So I, I really appreciate the question, Bob. I think it's actually an incredibly nuanced issue, right? Is what level of government should do what? And, and I think we have to 
think about that really carefully because I mean, as somebody who was in local government, often stymied by state and regional governments, you you know, and that's all over the United States. You have states preempting their municipalities from doing good things, um, uh, you know, in terms of zoning. So we have to be really careful. I also, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, perhaps I was just incredibly naive, but one of the things that really surprised me when I started working with the state government is how much they thought of themselves as essentially city council members, right? They they didn't have a regional view. They didn't have a statewide view. They had their their electorate, and that's who they represented, and nobody else mattered. And so they, you know, we we have tried, we tried for the eight years that I was, um, you know, involved in in city government to get the state of New York to lift the density cap. New York City, Manhattan has a density cap um, where you, you can build a commercial building um, way taller and more dense than you can build a residential building. And we tried every year to get that changed. And every year, every member of the state legislature would look at me like I was from Mars and say, what, you know, how do you think my constituents would feel about having the Empire State Building next to their single family house? And I'm like, you know, we're really not gonna do that, but, <laughs> but, but you know, they, they are, were incredibly parochial. And so we have to be, just let's think about this really carefully and, and realize the nuance. Yeah, there are members of the Connecticut General Assembly who are simultaneously the first electmen of their suburban town, um, which is New England speak for mayor. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, one way to thread the needle is with requirements that localities exercise the authority, but subject to some kind of regional, you know, the Mount Laurel, the New Jersey, um, the New Jersey approach. And obviously it requires a regulatory structure uh, to enforce and in um, many of our states we might say that that's the rule but we have never um, we have never enforced it I um, I tend to agree that maybe not universally but but there are opportunities for regionalism um, and I would um, I would say it's not just around zoning um, it's also around infrastructure um, sewers are a big example we have transit-oriented sites in Connecticut on the Metro North within that hour commuting shed of New York City where the site across the street from the train station doesn't have sewers, right? Um, and the, uh, if a developer seeks to build it, the um, sewer authority that they've got to go get permission from to extend the sewers, even at their own cost, is the town council. Um, so that's screaming out for some kind of regional infrastructure development um, may be something like what the federal government government requires in connection with transportation of MPOs. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but we actually haven't put that much thought into it, I don't think, even as an elite consensus, right, of who ought to, who ought to figure out where the sewers go. Um, so yes, yes to regionalism, what form it takes, I'm not quite sure, and it's, it's not just land use and zoning, unfortunately. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Peter. Um, so I'm, what I'm thinking about uh, obs or, um, objections that people have to this kind of general agenda, one is the character of the neighborhood, another one is falling home prices. And I'm curious, uh, regarding home prices, people have, I think, rationally thought of their homes as their most valuable financial asset. Um, they've responded to incentives for you know from all levels of government to do that. Um, and I see that as if someone says I'm really, really concerned that my home prices are going to drop, and that is like kind of our goal generally, like we want home prices to drop. Um, how do we respond to that objection? Does that mean that there needs to be a broader shift away from thinking of homes as financial assets? Um, what is, how does that fit into the big picture? Is that also like a significant, do you view that as a significant driver of the objections compared to the uh, character of the neighborhoods? Thanks. 
So yes and no. Um, that That's certainly one of the objections that gets voiced a lot. I think sometimes that is very genuine. Um, I am more sympathetic to that coming from sort of middle income neighborhoods. Uh, you know, if property values in Weston and Wellesley were to drop by 10% because they built some apartments, the people who live there would be fine, right? I mean, so like if your house is worth $2 million, a 10% decline is not gonna kill you. And also those people have, you know, like pension funds that are outside of their house. So this sometimes gets brought up, you know, this is my house, everything I own is in this and I have to protect it. And that's uh, sometimes genuine and sometimes not. You know, Vicky can probably talk more about some of the research that the Furman Center has done and published, you know, building nicely designed apartments, whether they're market rate or subsidized, um, in most communities does not lower property values um, or, you know, I mean, barely at all. And in some cases actually raises it. So, you know, there have been some studies where building subsidized housing actually raises the value of surrounding properties because it's often replacing a vacant site or a blighted site. Um, you know, this is obviously sort of nuanced. There's not sort of a, you know, a blanket like this kind of building is always going to raise or lower property values. It's going to be context specific. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, the, the I don't want anything in my neighborhood to change. I've been living here a long time. I like it. I, I think is very deeply held by almost everybody who protests. And that's actually quite true across the income spectrum. That's cr true across race. It's true across age, although I think more so for people who've been in a community for a long time. And I think we do have to take it seriously that people are attached to the places they live. Um, you know, and certainly for sort of negotiating purposes, acknowledging that people have that attachment and care and you know, they know their neighbors. And, uh, uh, you know, they have their routines and so forth. That is very true. But also that, you know, we have this idea now that when you buy into a neighborhood that you are essentially buying the right to control what your pro the properties around you do in perpetuity, which just isn't true, right? I mean, you're, you're, you own your house, you don't own your neighbor's house. You don't own all of the houses in the surrounding half mile of area. Um, and there's no guarantee that you got that your neighborhood is gonna stay exactly the same. You know, housing is also a risky asset, right? So <laughs> you bought your house thinking the price would never go down, that's not not true when you buy stocks. That's not true for any other financial investment. And people need to recognize that there's risk involved and that there's no government guarantee that your house will be protected forever. I just want to make explicit one thing Jenny just said. So I think you're right. It's not that people care about the character of their community, because if they did, they'd come out against the strip malls or the gas stations or whatever, and they don't. I mean, they care about things not changing. Um, and I think one thing that is true is that if you don't let the buildings change, other things will change and they will be less visible to you. But your community that once upon a time might have housed um, lawyers next to school teachers will just house lawyers next to investment bankers. You can hold the built environment context constant, but other things will change around you. And getting people to really identify what it is that they like about their community um, and not assume that it's always just the buildings, um, I think is a really hard thing, but something that you can only really do in conversation and on the and on the ground and outside of the kind of adversarial participation process. I and mean, what is it that you like about this place? And is that really that thing? Is that thing that you really like going to be threatened by 67 units of family housing? Um, so I, can I just make two points? I mean. Um, the Furman Center has done a great many studies about how various kinds of housing, other things affect surrounding property values, and those can be very powerful. I mean, um, we did a study relating to supportive housing that that has really helped move the needle of the discussions on that. But but I think the harder issue is the one that you very appropriately raise, is that on the one hand, we celebrate home ownership as the great way to build wealth. And on the other hand, it is exactly the building of wealth that's causing people to be so risk averse and so uh, so worried about changes. And we haven't resolved that, and we don't really even talk about it much, right? So I appreciate you really raising the question. And, you know, we have to confront that and we have to start saying, well, but, you know, for your house to have so much value means that your children are not going to be able to afford a house. And, you know, we got to confront that. And we also have to confront the ways in which some of what we do in 
in, for example, the affordable housing space works counter to that, right? A, a, a danger of community land trusts, for example, is that they can become the same kind of NIMBYs that, you know, uh, that others have. I mean, we, in the city of New York, when we first started uh, building affordable housing, we did it mostly as home ownership. And those homeowners will not let any, <laughs> any multifamily housing come into East New York or Brownsville or, you know, places that should be much, much denser. Um, so we, we, we really need to think hard and confront those questions. We're, can, oh, sorry. Go ahead. If I could briefly add, you know, home ownership is an act that changes your political behavior. We know that when you become a homeowner, you start voting in local elections. And homeowners vote at much, much higher rates in local elections, especially the ones that are on weird off cycles. In Massachusetts, they seem to vote in April or June on tax overrides and all. And it's overwhelmingly homeowners. And renters, when you talk about voting, some of them say, I don't feel like I should be voting on this because I might not be here that long. And homeowners also express a lot of views that are anti-renter, that maybe renters shouldn't have a voice uh, in these things. And so I think that one thing when you're talking to homeowners about it is that tell them what an important role renters play in their communities and that you can be a long-term renter and a fixture of your community just like a long-term homeowner and thinking about supply of housing and rental housing uh, there is really important for maintaining your community the way it is. Uh, we're hitting up at, at, against the end of our time. I want to try to get one more question in, but we, we do have a reception after this. I, I, I think that the panelists are planning to stick around, so hopefully uh, we can engage in some conversation with them there. I'll go to one more question uh, right here. Thank you. Thank you, and appreciate your time here. Danielle, uh, I'm with the Mayor's Office of Housing. I'm the director for the Office of Housing Stability, and I also adjunct at Suffolk Law. I teach access to justice. But one of the questions that I had of, as we're having this discussion is around the mindset of NIMBYism and what that process looks like of actually changing the mindset of these individuals who are already homeowners because a lot of the people that are potentially moving into this community look like myself and there may be an idea or assumption that oh if this person moves into this community to your points earlier the property is going to go down and there's going to be high rates of crime of crime so my question to one of you all of you is what types of trainings, if any, are you providing to these homeowners to say, or is the onus on them to say, hey, stop being ignorant of what you think um, people of color moving into your community is? So thank you. So I'll just say uh, one framing, which is that not all homeowners are NIMBYs. Not all homeowners are sort of deeply committed to keeping neighborhoods the way they are. Um, you know, most of most of the NIMBYs are homeowners, but not all homeowners are NIMBYs, if we put it that way. And um, the you know, I think the good news for the pro housing movement, pro housing advocates in general, is that you know there's some deeply committed NIMBYs. There. Are some deeply committed YIMBYs, and then there are a whole lot of people in between who just go about their day job, and this is not at the top of mind, right? So they haven't thought deeply about it. They may have heard some things in the past, um, but there are a lot of people who can be reached with a relatively blank slate, and we can tell them about the benefits of more development. You know, and I, I certainly think in, a, in you know places like Boston to point out that if you have more homes, you can support more neighborhood-serving retail, right? More density actually supports a lot of the businesses that people like. It brings more people, it brings more vibrancy. Um, you know, so we, talking up the, the benefits of the kinds of housing that we're proposing, I think is really helpful. It's a, it's a very significant um, problem and it, it um, <laughs> gets even um, more difficult in some cases where you've got greater density and you, you've got you know, uh, an apartment building um, with shared spaces. Um, and you and you have many of the sort of implicit and explicit biases that that come with um, having neighbors that you haven't had before, right? And I think um, it's one thing that uh, developers ha are, have become increasingly sensitive to how they can try to build community, um, how p building managers are trying to work to build community and and reach across some of of, of those. Um, of those gulfs, and as policymakers, um, people need to be aware of the ways in which they can contribute to that, right? And so, um, f uh, you know, a good example is 
when New York City funds affordable housing within, uh, most of our housing is, is mixed income housing. So you have people who are paying $6,000 in rent for the apartment and you have people who are paying $600 a rent or, or, or less. And it's really important that um, you not have, you know, that the, the B line is the poorer people and the, you know, C line is the middle income people, that people not be able to, to see sort of those kinds of, of badges. Um, I'm, and I'm talking here about income. I understand that that doesn't always translate in terms of, of, of race um, and that that race, race and immigrant status, all kinds of things just, you know, have to be, you have to build community and, and make people feel like this is my neighbor um, and, and, and I have a relationship with, with those people. And I do, I do want to push back just a little bit on the notion that, um, uh, of home ownership and nimbyism. It's actually not just home ownership. It's where a significant part of your wealth is tied up in current housing arrangements. So renters who have, who have the protections of, for example, rent stabilization can become just as invested in keeping that um, very uh, financially a beneficial arrangement as a homeowner. It's really about how your your stakes in that issue, and especially in cities where there are higher percentage, higher shares of renters, you see renters becoming, uh, in many cases, uh, NIMBYs just just as much as as the homeowners. So we have to, you know, understand what's driving it, and what's driving the the suspicion of other people. Um, and the suspicion that my, my, the neighborhood that felt home to me is changing, right? It may just be my coffee shop is no longer there. It's been replaced by a fancier coffee shop. But people are very attached, and we actually want that attachment. That, that, does, that helps build social capital in various ways. And so, you know, so we have to really work to find new ways of, of building community. I think one thing I'll just add really quickly in terms of um, conversations with homeowners that can be compelling, um, having done this road show quite a lot um, in suburban towns in my neck of the woods, is that the history, you know, some people get turned off about a conversation with a conversation about the history, but for some people it's really informative. And to um, start with, um, you know, this town had starter homes. You were zoned for quarter acre lots, one eighth of an acre lots. And many of you whose families have been here for a long time, that's when you got here, right? That's when your family got here, when it was possible to build a house on 8,000 square feet, right? Um, and the timeline in my neck of the woods, I'm sure it's true in parts, parts in, around here as well, is in the this, in this early 70s, right around the time when, um, there were certain kinds of discrimination that were falling away, or at least backing off a little bit, I don't know. Um, your town made a very explicit, a very explicit um, and timely in kinds of ways that are pretty nefarious decision to down zone. And you didn't always have minimum one acre lots. Um, you didn't always have minimum two acre lots, but you have them now. Um, and digging into how that happened, when that happened, um, when those towns got populated, how that aligns with when the closest city was trying to take efforts to desegregate the schools, um, and to tell that story can be um, can be informative. And I, I have to tell you, like it does turn some people off, and I have lost some audiences um, or some individual members of audiences. But on the whole, if somebody came into that church basement to hear have the conversation, they're probably receptive to going there. I think that's a wrap. So thank you so much to all of our panelists.